woman. There are 76 million of us just here in the US. We are the biggest generation that ever existed. We were called the me ones, the crazy ones, and boy, do we know what that means, don't we? In fact, we have reinvented every single phase of our life. We were the yuppies, we were the hippies. We like innovation. Well, now we are in the winter of our life. And I can assure you, this is not going to be your average winter. I invite you to join me at Boomerology Reviews every single week so we can figure out how boomers are reshaping this phase of their lives. Join me. This episode of Boomerology Revealed is brought to you by Standard, your best option for mobility products. Be independent with Standard.com. Welcome to Boomerology Revealed TV. I'm Shahar Boyayan, your host. In the next 20 minutes, we are going to visit a cookie conference. Yes, there are cookie conferences. We are going to learn more about this art and maybe it's a great option for a hobby or home-based business for you. We are also going to talk about some facts about boomer women, a very cool health tip and a lot more. Join me, let's watch. Today we are visiting a cookie convention. Yes, like in sugar cookies. Never heard of them before, but I know they're becoming very, very popular. So let's see what it's all about. I bet this is going to be very sweet. I'm here with Karen Somers, one of the organizers of the Cookie Con Conference Salt Lake City 2014. Karen, tell me how many cookies you prepare for this conference. About 3,000. Just baked for people to decorate. Wow. Tell me one thing, why a cookie conference? How did you come up with this idea? Well, a few years ago, I went to a, a gathering of about 20 decorators in Tennessee. I just thought that it was such a fun thing and it needed to be available for everyone, not just 20. And so we decided, my husband Mike and I decided that we should come back and see if we could figure out how to make it happen for more people. This is your second conference, right? That's correct, yep. First one we had about a year and a half ago here in Salt Lake as well. We actually have people from I, I think over 40 of our 50 states and from over 16 countries. So. Wow, all that, wow, that's cool, isn't it? Yeah, it's really an international event, so we're excited about that. You know, you see amazing works of art in cookies, right? Painting and, and all types of decorating, but the cookie doesn't last. So why do you think people really get attracted into creating art in something that is going to go away very fast? That's a good question. You know, I think people just really like to give a unique gift or receive something that's, you know, just eye-popping and unusual. And, you know, to receive something beyond just a plain cookie that's also a work of art, you know, it's two in one. Sure, it's something they eat, but it's something that they can really appreciate to look at, too. You have an online business since 2007, right? Tell me a little bit about this. Well, in 2007, um, I had, well, let's back up. In 2001, I had a baby. Um, and. I wasn't working and I wanted to do something to do with cookies because I had been a cookie decorator before. And so I made a website, well my husband made it for me, uh, with some instructions on how to decorate cookies. And between 2001 and 2007, um, I had gotten a lot of um, questions on where I buy my supplies. And so in 2007 I thought I should just start selling a few. And so from my basement I started selling cookie cutters and food coloring and it has just grown from there. And it's the family business today, it's the main business. Yes, it is the main family business now. How do you see this industry growing? You know, it is growing. It, a lot of people who traditionally have perhaps decorated cakes are also starting to decorate cookies. They see it as just something a little easier to get, you know, a project done without, you know, a large you know, project to, you know, perhaps fall over and mess up. If they do mess up on a cookie, they could just create another one and it has grown so much just since I started. Before in 2001 it was teeny tiny um, and it has just grown and grown and grown and in the last year um, it feels like it has just kind of exploded. It, it feels like cookies are going to be the next cupcake. I'm here with Julia Usher and I have to tell you, every single person I talk about cookies, they say you're the queen of cookies, is that right? Oh, I don't know. That's just immensely honoring to have heard that said. So, Tell me how you got started with cookies. 
I actually got started by cookies in cookies by doing cakes. I had a cake bakery for about 10 years in St. Louis, Missouri, which is my hometown, and I always did cookies as kind of a sideline. It wasn't until I closed my bakery and I wrote a book, which happened to be about cookies, that I got really deeply entrenched in the cookie world. My books kind of took me much further into cookies than I ever envisioned. I would call myself primarily a cookie instructor. I spend most of my time teaching, whether it be through books. I have two books out, whether it be through videos. I have both a DVD and a YouTube channel. And I also host an online cookie forum, which is, which is huge. It's the largest forum of its type for cookies online. People share photographs, they share tips, so you have lots of voices coming together and giving a broader view of what cookie decorating is all about. We have about 3,000 active members and many more people that just visit the site who aren't actual members of the site, who are just viewing and browsing. So the activity is quite large. I think within a couple of months we were averaging about a million views or interactions with the site a month. The other cool thing about it is it's global. So we've got members from I think 45 different countries. Membership's free by the way, so people come and participate and, and gather information at no cost. As an artist, this is an art that goes away very fast. So what do you think about it? Are you just okay with that? Or? You know, I think that there's nothing better than spending time on on making something and if it's whether it's in the expression of the food itself and in the flavors or in the design I think it's important because that time is a signal to that person consuming the product that you love them that you care about them that you took time out of your busy day to make them something special so I fully intend for the things I make to be eaten but I also want them to suggest to the person getting them that I love them and that's why I spend all the time doing it. So I think both go hand in hand. What's next for you? Next for me is I'm doing an online uh, cookie decorating course through Craftsy. Do you know Craftsy.com? So I'll be shooting that sometime this summer. I'm traveling extensively in Europe this year. Not only do I get to teach, but I get to see parts of the world that I wouldn't see otherwise. And I'm so grateful to the hosts that have invited me to those. We, we are broadcast in Europe as well. Oh, and I heard you are also going to Brazil, right? I'm going to Brazil at the, for a large-scale cookie convention similar to this one, okay. which will be August 30th and 31st. And I've got information both on my Facebook page and also on Cookie Connection about the details of that event and how to sign up. It's funny, but everywhere I go, I meet some Brazilians. And I have my new best friends here. They came from Brazil to attend this conference. Right, I'm Margaret from Cookeria by Margaret in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Hey, what's, what's your blog? My blog is Cookeria by Margaret. And this is Wayne, and what do you do, Wayne? Yeah, well, in Brazil, I do cookies. I have a cookie business in Brazil, and inspired by the French art. So, me and Margaret, we are working in Brazil as a, the, new, the new thing in the market. So, cookies are the new thing in the market there? Yes, sure. In Brazil, we are like, we have cupcakes, we have, uh, and Brazilian, Brazilian threads, but there, uh, cupcakes, oh, uh, cookies are like, the new thing. The new thing, right? Now, I know that you're going to have really a conference like this one there. When, when is that? That's going to be in uh, August, 31st, August 30 and 31st, and it's going to be in Sao Paulo. And uh, we're going to have as an international guest, Julia Usher. Yes, I know. She's the queen of cookies around here, right? No, she does very elaborate cookies and 3D and dimensional cookies. And we want to show this art to Brazilians. Now, are there any differences in the cookies here or in Brazil? What there is a difference because Brazilian parties, uh, we have about 50 kids on a Brazilian party. That's a regular party. And so cookies have to be a little more simple. So we are able to deliver a good cookie and a good quality of uh, decorating job on the cookies. This is quite different from the U.S. And in Brazilian, uh, or I mean in Brazil, uh, people prefer more clean lines in decorating. Not too elabor elaborate, right? Few colors and very smooth and clean. Oh, what about, what is your take on that? Because you're here for a reason, right? Yes. What do you want to get from it? Actually, here I'm, 
I'm, I'm looking for new ideas and inspirations because Americans, they are like uh, the first uh, the first word about cookies. And in Brazil, we have like different uh, ways to see the life and our, and our occasions that, such as uh, uh, marriages are is very different. And about the number of the cookies, like set, the sets in Brazil needs to be like, uh, make it simple, yes. But we can uh, enjoy the American way of seeing things to improve our our experience our our experience about cookies. Okay. And do you see a lot of people there uh, going from a hobby to a business with the cookies? Yes. Quite a few. I give many classes to Brazilians now. I was a hobbyist and I started my business and start uh, being asked to give classes and uh, there's quite a few people interested in going into this world. I have a cookie shop. Mm -hmm. I decorate with royal icing and do custom design cookies. How long have you been doing that? Over 10 years. Okay. Now you are one of the presenters here at the conference, so tell me about your topic. My topic was about going from having uh, working in your home, doing cookies, into a brick and mortar shop. Taking the big step of having a real bit. Taking the big step, uh, talking about the expense. Can you tell me three things as a tip for them of what they have to be aware of when they, they are taking this big step? Um, when you're finding a location, you need to go to the zoning department first thing. Make sure that the property is zoned for having that kind of business. Um, my mistake was not checking out my equipment. Make sure you talk to an electrician and make sure everything will work with the type of electricity available in the building. It's always going to take longer. Um, I expected to open a month earlier when we did and then Hurricane Sandy came knocking on our door. So um, it will go, but it's going to take longer than you think. How is the market for bakers and cookie decorators? In my area, I live in uh, Fairfield County in Connecticut, so it's a higher income area. So I am able to do a more detailed cookie and get a, a higher price for it. So for me, I am definitely making money for it. Um, my cookies favor start at $5 a piece and go up from there. A lot of corporate orders, doing corporate logos, um, personalized favors for children's parties, sports parties, and the local sports teams. So there's a cookie for everything, and that's my, that's my logo, a cookie for every occasion. Can you tell me, if people want to know more about you, where they could go, how they could get in touch with you? They can go onto my website, www.paintedcookie.com, and you can contact me through the website. I got my weapons, now let's get started. Okay, this is the result of my first try. You know, it might not be a work of art, but it was really fun to make. Now, I kind of think I don't have a bright future with cook decoration, so let's take a look at what the other people are doing. So what are you doing there? I'm doing uh, the outline of the cookie. And how did you get the, the flowers? I painted it and it's my first time ever. <laughs> you never made cookies before? It's the first first time? Yeah, I did it like three years ago. And, I, and my first cookie was like, oh my god, it's awful. But then I practiced and practiced and practiced and I'm learning. And it's awesome. It's awesome and I really love it. This is a stencil Hello. that was done, and then I came back and put the dots on top. This is a copy cake image drawn with the overhead projector, and then filled in. And that's this one's airbrushed. It's just, it's just I've never airbrushed, so that's what that is. So it's a lot of fun to be here, right? It is a blast to be here. 
How long have you been making cookies? I've been making cookies most of my life, but I didn't start getting this interested in it until about three years ago. And I, I saw it online somewhere, and one thing led to another, and I was hooked. Hey, how long have you been making decorated cookies? About three years. Do you do it as a hobby or as a profession? A little of both. It's, a, it's kind of my night job. The cookie you're making is really, really pretty. Uh, is this usually the style you, you decorate? I, yeah, I kind of do more the whimsical. These are, they call them mystery shapes, and so you just have to see something in them. And so, yeah, I kind of do cutesy stuff. What's the process for you to decorate? I can see you start with a drawing as well. I usually try and sketch. That way I don't waste a lot of icing. I use um, all the techniques and I'm learning and learning. How long have you been doing that? Like a nine months, but I'm an art teacher and all my life I've been in oil paint. That's the kind of entrepreneur I like. Nine months business. So tell me about this technique. This is my first thing. Okay. I paint a cookie. For a first time, that's very good. You should see my first time on the table. And my technique, it's if I don't have the white color, I need to make a room when I use dark colors to, for the light. White colors are light. Every cookie, every paint we have to do, it's let the space for dark colors and, and light colors. And do you see the way I left white color in the middle? I have a page in Facebook. It's Artastic Cookies. Artastic Cookies. I'm here with Carrie Wilson from, from Twirled Up. Carrie, tell me a little bit about your story with cookies. With cookies. I've been a home baker for many, many years and decorating since I was about 18. Not to the level of many of these women here. But um, I was frustrated and always wanted the cookie bouquets and never had the cookies on a stick pre-made and ready to go but I always had plenty of the regular ones packaged. So out of the frustration of wanting cookie bouquets without sticks, I developed the twirl. Okay. So this, this is the is twirl. The twirl. Okay. This is the twirl. It's designed to hold a packaged treat or cookie or a variety of objects. Also it has a center where you can place in a, a cookie pop or even if you still want the cookie on a stick, it makes removal out of uh, the styrofoam or whatever you're placing the cookie stick into because the removal is so easy. Okay. It doesn't damage your arrangement at all and uh, it, it's easily moved and rearranged. You told me that it took you about three years to develop the product, correct? Yes, it did. So I've been working and designing this for about three years and uh, finally got my patent and got it manufactured. It's made out of stainless steel. You can put it in water or a flower arrangement, it will not rust. And it's, it so, supports a substantial amount of weight. I could use also for flowers then? Absolutely. How do you see this market for, for a business like yours? I think it's a, a very open market. There's nothing like this on the market. Um, it's a, a new innovative product. So yeah, I, I seem to see a lot of buzz generating from it, from them seeing it visually. So it's a new concept to, for people to, to grasp, but it's being well received. So Tasha, tell me about Operation Cookie Takeover. <laughs> okay, Operation Cookie Takeover was where a bunch of cookiers got together while I was deployed to Afghanistan in April 2013. And they baked cookies for my entire fob that I was on. And we ended up with about 10,300 cookies when it was all said and done. 10,000 cookies. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they were mailed to us. What we did was we created a Facebook page, and the Facebook uh, page is still up. It's called Operation Cookie Takeover. And we put the notice out and gave a ship, uh, ship by date. So once that date hit, they started shipping the cookies, and I received them. I hand counted every last one of them. And uh, the date that we did it was April the 14th, and we laid them out on the fob for everybody to come and pick them up, and they had a ball. 
And you are a cookie decorator yourself, correct? I am. I am. Um, I do it on the side because I am still in the military. Uh, I just hit my 16 years three days ago. Really? So, yes, I did. So I have four years left before retirement. So uh, the Army is still my full time, but weekends and nights are usually spent cooking. What's next for this operation? And can we help? Yes, you can help. Like I said, we have a Facebook page, Operation Cookie Takeover. Uh, Samantha from We Deliver Love, she's in charge of the Facebook page. She's actually not here because she's pregnant, uh, getting ready to deliver. But once she has the baby, we're going to set up another uh, major takeover for the fall time frame. So if you want to join, just join the page. We'll keep you informed and it'll be the same. Operation Cookie Takeover, that's the next thing you need to do on Facebook and, you know, give your cookies a bigger purpose. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good one. What technique are you doing right now? So this would be brush embroidery. Okay. Mm -hmm. On cookies, right? Um, yeah, so what's the, what's the process? So first I'll give you a fresh one. Okay. I start with um, icing and I usually do it three humps at a time and there's many different ways to do it. This is how I do it. Okay. So I'll do one, two, three, pretty generous. And then I'm gonna get my paintbrush and just get it damp, dry it off. And then I'm just gonna drag it through to the center. And I'm looking for these little stroke lines makes it great for lace or for a detail on top of a flower to give a petal some dimension. And I just keep working it until you get it how you like it. What technique is this? This is fondant, working with fondant. Can you tell me a little bit how it works? Show us. I'm, I'm brand new to this, so uh, this is my first fondant cookie, but from what I understand, <laughs> I rolled out my fondant on this little mat, and it's a nonstick mat, and then I use these little, um, like uh, texture plates, and then I rolled that with my little roller on top of the um, the fondant, so I got a little pattern. And I'm doing a sailing cookie, so I have the just the lines going down. So, and then I have this lovely silicone mold that I bought yesterday from one of the vendors, and I'm just gonna push my um, fondant in it and pop it out. Hey, let's take a look. Yes. That's not too bad for a first try, yeah. So I can see you have a lot of experience in cookies, right? How long have you been ba making them? Um, less than two years, really. really. It's a, I think it's a, a skill that comes on quickly, mm -hmm. and you get better quickly, and then you kind of hit a wall. <laughs> What's your process for creating the cookie? If you'll look down here, I traced my cookie onto paper several times so I could... Um, draw my picture and change it and let it um, emerge as it gets better. I like to, for faces, I like to go online and um, Google and get ideas for faces. You usually make faces on your cookies? Well, no, not necessarily. Most of my cookies are for birthday parties, so simple numbers, um, some easy characters. I keep mine very simple because I know my own skill level. I know, I know my limits. And, and how long does it take you to make a cookie, to, to finish the decorated cookie? To do a whole set takes me about eight hours from thought process to finish. So I'm here with Connie Davis from BRP Boxes, and this is your business. The founders of our company, they started BRP Box Shop because there were a lot of um, big companies that made paperboard boxes, and they catered to big, big companies. And uh, the founders of our company decided they wanted to really have relationships with smaller companies and help out smaller companies that don't have an outlet to be able to get their boxes. For our cookie people, our most popular boxes are probably this Four and a, or seven by four and a half, and then also our ten by seven size. Um, cupcake boxes are really popular, and then the macaron boxes, oh, show that because they're which so are pretty. which are really really sweet, and those okay. are really popular too. How do you see this market going? 
Uh, I think it just continues to grow. Um, it, it just, um, there's such an online um, networking. The uh, cookie people are so open and sharing with all of their information. Um, I just see it getting bigger and bigger. And you're doing a, a informal research here, right? How, what, what are you doing, Zach? Yes, uh, we're asking people who come by our booth to vote on what they think that they would like in terms of the next boxes that we might make. That's um, smart. Yes, so they get to vote with a kernel of corn because we're from Iowa, the corn state, which is really cool. And we've been doing really good, so lots of fun. Hi, I'm here with Audrey Lilo, right? With Icing Smiles. Tell me about this organization. Um, Icing Smiles was formed a little bit uh, over three years ago. So, and we donate cakes to critically and terminally ill children and their siblings. Cakes are our mo main focus, but we also have a little secret, which is our cookie club. And if we're following our families that we served with cakes and notice that the kids are having a difficult time with their treatments, um, such as you know a cancer treatment, just having a really hard time, then we want to send them a little pick me up in the mail. And so we extend a call to one of our sugar angels, all our volunteers are called sugar angels, and ask them if they might send a dozen cookies in the mail, just kind of as a pick me up. And the families always appreciate it because sometimes they feel kind of forgotten um, going through all of what they go through. And it's just um, a nice little bright spot in their world. So if I want to volunteer and bake some cookies for families, I go to your website and is there a process or can I start doing? How, how is that? Uh -huh. You go to our website, icingsmiles.org, and um, you click on the link that says create a smile. And then you can choose the cookie. Well, you can choose to do cakes or cookies, cupcakes, what have you. Um, but they'll um, there'll be a little um, volunteer thing that you can do all the check off what you need to do, and you're entered very quickly because we need you right away. <laughs> Fantastic. Uh, tell me one thing. Do you serve uh, children in which areas, which places? We are all across the United States. We also have a chapter in Holland that has started in Holland. We are just amazed at the numbers of people that we have been able to serve. Um, due to social media and people sharing online, is really spread very quickly, and we're so happy with that. We're so excited. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. You know, now you just need to go to their website, sign up as a volunteer, and then you have another reason to bake more cookies. Okay, I have some boomer facts, and today they relate to women. Did you know that by 2030, there will be 715 million people over the age of 65. That's double of what we have right now. And more than half of them will be women. The other thing that I find very, very interesting is that we are going to the second decade of the 21st century. And now we are reaching parity in wages with men. Oh, finally, we are getting the same as men. Something that our grandmothers and grandfathers never expected. You know, Boomer women control over 60% of nation's wealth right now. And since we tend to outlive men by five years, we can expect that we will see a time when 80 to 90% of women will be in charge of their family financial affair. With this new economic fortitude, women have the opportunity to take previously untapped power into their hands to influence the direction of the marketplace, the workplace, the family, and worldwide leadership. And that's also something that our grandparents never imagined. Today, the product we are going to take a look at is called Great Grips by Stand. It's actually a very cool product, and I do have several of them at home. Great grips make it easy to turn round and awkward doorknobs. It's great for young children, arthritis sufferers, people with disabilities, and senior citizens who may have trouble gripping the door handle. This inexpensive alternative can save you hundreds in door handle replacements. It's fantastic, for example, when you're doing grocery shopping and you have your bags, uh, your hands full of bags. You just you know, touch that and it opens. So it's very cool and also it glows in the dark. So take a look at greatgripsbystandard.com. My name is Kara Clapp. I have a PhD. I'm a family nurse practitioner and we're here to talk about health for boomers. The rule of thumb for uh, women who are going through perimenopause 
is um, they might have a few hot flashes, uh, wake up with some night sweats, but officially you've entered into the territory of menopause uh, once you have had a cessation of periods for one calendar year. And at that point, you're then considered postmenopausal. So the number one question I get asked um, from women who are 50 is, do I need hormones after menopause? And honestly, it's a highly individual matter. The most important thing is, is if you are not sexually active at the time of your menopause, uh, your body will undergo natural changes. That means that the walls of the vagina will thin out and they become much more fragile and drier. If you're not sexually active at that time, uh, these may not be changes that you find um, very horrific. Some women will have more frequent UTIs because the tissues are drier. So if you're a woman who has a frequent bladder infection, you may want to consider re-estrogenifying those vaginal tissues to get away from having to take antibiotics all the time. But the main purpose beyond just uh, looking and feeling great, some women will supplement for hormones uh, for that reason, and it's okay. Uh, but number one, a sexually active woman at the time of menopause uh, sexual intercourse can be quite uncomfortable for her and her partner. So um, maintaining a lower dose of estrogen uh, is important, just enough to keep those walls uh, thicker and more youthful and keep them uh, lubricated. Uh, there are some different lubricants on the market, so everyone just has to try a few for their personal choices, find out what works best for them. But in the instance of using estrogen, if you have a uterus, you will have to take progesterone along with your estrogen supplements because um, unopposed estrogen is the known factor for uh, creating the environment for uterine cancer. And uh, typically uh, this um, information uh, that I'm telling you about comes from female surgeon and OBGYN by the name of uh, Polykov. Her work is well known. Uh, she sees the whole gamut from um, women's reproductive and preventing pregnancies because they're younger going through the aging changes of menopause and then seeing the surgical end of it because she's also a surgeon. So I follow her work because uh, she's most informed about all of the uterine cancers and things she finds as a surgeon and she recommends that um, you use progesterone um, if you have a functioning uterus. She does not require that um, women without a uterus uh, use the progesterone. There's no reason to. You can do little bits of estrogen then it just boils down to a fact of are you comfortable taking a pill or would you prefer to have a cream or would you prefer to have a cream that's actually inserted intravaginally obviously if you uh, do it intravaginally the effects are more local so you don't get the systemic effects because we're bypassing the liver but you still get the youthfulness of the tissues so sexual intercourse can remain comfortable so it's it's basically the form of the hormone replacement uh, is taken on by what the woman wants to achieve with her treatment goals other than that Enjoy. Life after 50 is fun and great, and I'm enjoying it myself. You know, I was looking the other day on bands from the 60s and 70s, and I found two very interesting facts. One of them, did you ever think about how many songs from that time, especially the 60s, talk about food? It's amazing. There's lollipop, apple and jam, and all kinds of stuff. I'm actually going to compile a list of the music that talk about food. But the second is, how many groups out there had animal names in them? Well, the Beatles, you heard before. My personal favorite, the monkeys. And here's some more for you. The birds, the turtles, the eagles, the yard birds. Buffalo Springfield, the Critters, and I know there are more. You know, if you remember of a group from the 60s or 70s that are named after animals, please leave a comment. I would like to compile this list because I thought it was pretty funny. I hope you enjoyed the show this week. If you did, don't forget to share, thumbs up, rate our channel. These are the type of things that keep us going. And I'll meet you next week at Boomerology Revealed. This episode of Boomerology Revealed is brought to you by Standard, your best option for mobility products. 
be independent with Standard.com.